Welcome to worship at Wild Rose United Church and to this uh, beloved community who seek to embody the welcome of Jesus. No matter who you are, where you've been or who you love, there is a place for you here. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister here at Wild Rose United Church. With me in the sanctuary this morning providing leadership are uh, Dan Somerville and Diane McKenzie, Bill Aitken, Corinne Salajano, uh, Don McIntosh, Charles Moore, Barbara Grant, uh, Claude Mathieu, Wendy LaSalle, and Linda Ellis. Uh, wherever you are, however you're accessing this service, if you are able, uh, I wonder if you will go into the chat or comment section and let us know who you are and that you are watching. This will give us uh, a record that will not only be very helpful for us, but also very meaningful for us. As we gather, we acknowledge with, his, with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the indigenous peoples of this land. Here at Wild Rose United Church, we are on the traditional territory of the Treaty 7 First Nations, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Kainai, Pekani, and uh, Siksika First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation, and the Stony uh, Nakoda, made up of the Wesley Bears Paw and Chiniki Nations. And Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Zone 3. We are all treaty people and we all have work to do in healing and reconciling the broken relationships of centuries. 
Today in worship, some of us will be wearing orange. Orange is the uh, color for truth and reconciliation in the relationships between indigenous people and settler uh, culture in Canada. Right now is the Sunday that we would normally be celebrating Canada Day, and so we will uh, acknowledge Canada Day in uh, the prayers of the people. But it is also a time of tremendous grief and mourning. Not only for the 5% of Canadians who identify as Indigenous, but uh, uh, for um, many, many, many more of us. Some of us have been aware of the number of children who did not return home from the Indian Residential School program. But many more of us are becoming aware. And the concrete recovery, not discovery, but recovery, of uh, remains from unmarked graves of children who died while attending those institutions uh, is a time for stepping back and uh, grieving and acknowledging the pain that comes with our history. So our Canada Day uh, recognition will also be tempered by our acknowledgement of the pain that we are living through in this moment in history. Thank you to everyone who participated in the Effective Structures conversation this past Monday. Uh, a report uh, has gone and will go to uh, the board and then uh, the rest of the congregation will see some evidence of that. Uh, the remaining scheduled conversation on leadership recruitment uh, will take place on the 20th of July, uh, the Monday around the 20th of July. It might be the 19th, I don't know, it's the 19th. And the summer newsletter is available. Uh, you can download it by going to the community contact email. Uh, I believe it, uh, it either is on the website or will be on the website soon. And uh, if you don't receive the community contact, then you can reach out to us and ask for that newsletter. Now, uh, Wendy will light our Christ candle and uh, followed by Barbara with the call to worship. Dear God, we light this candle to remind us that Christ is present, shining in, on our hearts and brightening the world. Amen. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms 126. When God prospered our city, it was like a dream. Our mouths back then were filled with laughter and joy. Holy One, prosper us now like a stream in the desert. May planters who cry now shout out for joy at the harvest. May those who depart in tears carrying their seeds Come home rejoicing with great bundles of grain. Amen. As people of God, we are called to participate in God's renewing and transforming work in the world. Here in worship, we dare to open ourselves to God's staggering grace. Here we offer all of ourselves to the light of love in an opening prayer. Let us pray. 
God of peace and hope. Sometimes it seems like the powers that steal life from your world are growing greater, and the opportunities for grace and healing are fewer and fewer. Help us to recognize the places in our lives where we are participating in systems of violence and oppression, in our homes, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. Help us to respond to horror with love and to terror with grace. Help us to rid ourselves of the desire to place ourselves above others in any way. Let us find hearts of peace instead of fear as we strive to walk your path in troubled times. Amen. The peace candle is a tradition that has spread in the last, uh, oh, 35, 40 years or so from congregation to congregation. It's come to us from my former congregation, uh, Rundle Memorial United in Banff. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. Peace is that state which emerges when those who have much do not have too much, and those who have little do not have too little. When the very old and the very young feel supported and secure, parents can feed their children and themselves, and all have the opportunity for meaningful work in their community. Let us pray and work for that kind of peace. Next, we have uh, a hymn led by Dan and Linda.
I have a book to share this morning. It's a book about when people try to tell us who or what we can be instead of listening to what our insides tell us. It's called Piggy Bunny, and it's story by Rachel Vale, pictures by Jeremy Tankard, and it's uh, published in 2012 by uh, Fievel and Friends. Liam was just like all the other piglets, except for one thing. All the other piglets wanted to be pigs when they grew up. Liam wanted to be the Easter Bunny. Liam tried to practice hopping. He tried to enjoy salad. And he tried to deliver eggs. The Easter Bunny asked Liam's big brother, Seriously? Yes, said Liam. You are a piglet, said Liam's big sister. Deal with it. I am dealing with it, said Liam. Liam was dealing with it by trying to practice hopping and trying to enjoy salad and trying to deliver eggs. You are a terrific piglet, said Liam's mom. We love your squiggly tail and your little black eyes and your snouty nose and your adorably triangular ears. You are perfect, said Liam's dad, just exactly the way you are. Just exactly the way I am, said Liam, is like a piglet who is going to be the Easter Bunny. Do we even believe in the Easter Bunny? Asked Liam's little sister. Um, said Liam's dad. We are more of a believing in oinking family. I believe in the Easter Bunny, said Liam. When Liam's grandparents came to visit, Everyone said, oink. Oink, 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 oink. Everybody except Liam. Liam said, hello, my name is Liam and I'll be your Easter bunny. Bunny, asked Liam's grandpa. Did this piglet just say he's a bunny? The Easter bunny, Liam explained. Ex explained. Oh, said grandpa. He doesn't look like a bunny to me, said one of the neighbors. All the pigs and piglets stared at Liam. He didn't look like a bunny to any of them. Of course he doesn't look like a bunny, said Liam's dad. He looks like a perfect piglet. And he doesn't have to try to be anything else, said Liam's mom. He's our piglet and we love him. Liam felt loved but he also felt sad. Everybody was sure he could never be the Easter Bunny. Liam knew they were wrong, but he wondered a little bit. What if they were right? Liam sighed. This is the kind of problem, he said, that is called heartbreaking. Baloney, said Liam's grandma. They just have the imagination of a kumquat, the lot of them. She shook her large head. Go put on your Easter Bunny suit, Liam. Then they'll see. Liam blinked his little black eyes. But Grandma, he said, I don't have an Easter Bunny suit. Liam's grandma smiled gently. This, or Grandpa smiled gently. This is the kind of problem, he whispered, that is called fixable. Liam hopped around his grandparents, his triangular ears twitching with excitement. You know how to make an Easter Bunny suit, he asked them. Absolutely not, said Grandma. We will order one on the internet. 
While he waited for his Easter bunny suit to arrive, Liam practiced hopping and enjoying salad and delivering eggs. He got pretty good, though salad remained a challenge. On a side note, pigs love salad. When his suit finally arrived, Liam tried it on. It was a bit tight in some places and way big in others. One of the long bunny ears had trouble standing up straight, even after Grandma fiddled with the wire inside it. Also, it was itchy. Liam looked in the mirror. He didn't notice the string hanging down in front of his snout or the wobbly ear or the two long sleeves or the seam coming open a tiny bit across his belly. He even stopped noticing the itch. Because what he saw in the mirror looking back at him was Liam the Easter Bunny. Liam smiled and whispered, Yes. Off he hopped, delivering eggs. And everybody believed in him. So if you're someone who knows inside who you're supposed to be and people around you don't believe in you, I hope you can find a place where someone will believe in you and will help you show everyone who you're supposed to be. Claude is going to read our scripture. A reading today is from the book of Malachi. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have deviated from my laws and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the God of divine multitudes. But you say, in what sense must we return? Should a person deceive God, yet you deceive me. But you say, how have we deceived you? With your tenth part gifts and offerings, you are being cursed with a curse, and you, the entire nation, are robbing me. Bring the whole tenth part to the storage house so there might be food in my house. Please test me in this, says the God of divine multitudes. See whether I do not open all the windows of the heavens for you and empty out a blessing until there is enough. I will threaten the one who wants to devour you so that it doesn't spoil the fruit of your fertile land and so that the vine doesn't drop its fruit before its time, says the God of divine multitudes. <clears throat> All the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a desirable land, says the God of divine multitudes. You have spoken harshly about me, says the Holy One, but you say, what have we spoken about you? You said, serving God is useless. What do we gain by keeping God's obligation or by walking around as mourners before the God of divine multitudes? So now we consider the arrogant fortunate. Moreover, those doing evil are built up. They test God and escape unscathed. The trustworthy words of God's faithful people. The divine, divine word of us today. today. Amen. So it's the last in our series on uh, the 12 minor prophets. They're uh, 12 books at the back of our Old Testament uh, that are called the minor prophets, not because they are uh, less important or less relevant, but simply because they are shorter 
than uh, what we call the major prophets. And today's reading is from Malachi, which is uh, the last of the twelve. And because uh, the book of the twelve is at the end of our Old Testament in our Christian Bible, Malachi is the end of the Old Testament. Malachi is probably anonymous, possibly written by uh, some other figure in the scripture, someone like uh, Ezra, or possibly written by someone whose name we just don't know. But Malachi isn't a name. Malachi is a... uh, an adjective, which comes from the sentence uh, or the phrase, uh, the words of the messenger of God. If it was a name, it would uh, have a, uh, a ya or an L in it, like Ezekiel or Jeremiah. So it might be Malachiya if it were a name. But it's an adjective. And it's written, unlike the others we've spoken about this month, it's written at a very different time in the history of God's people. It's not only placed at the end of the Old Testament, it is very likely the most recent book in the Old Testament. Others may have undergone some changes, some edits, some additions. But this is possibly the last book to be written as a whole. In between the times we've been talking about the rest of this month and the time of of the book of Malachi, The Jewish homeland was overrun by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. We'll hear about this in our months on the major prophets because those are the stories of that time. The stories of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and the, uh, uh, the different portions of Isaiah. and the book of Daniel. The Jewish homeland completely overrun, completely demolished by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The educated classes carried off uh, the Neo-Assyrian and the Babylonian empires. The, uh, The ruling classes, the educated classes, carried off to the capital city of Babylon. Jerusalem destroyed the temple in Jerusalem built by King Solomon 700 years earlier. Not 700, forgive me. 500 years earlier. Leveled. Seventy years. An entire generation born lived and died in the time that the exiles, those uh, educated peoples, the ruling classes, had been carried off to the capital. They were there for 70 years until the Persian Empire arose, took power, and allowed them to return. They returned under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, And they began building another temple. The relationship between the people who returned from Babylon, who were a completely different people than the ones who had been carried off there. The ones 
the ones who had been carried away from Jerusalem, if any of them still survived at the time of the return, were extremely elderly and had been very, very young. Seventy years. Think about the things that were happening 70 years ago. 1951. The Korean War. We have the benefit of the memory of so many people uh, around us in their 80s and 90s and 70s. We have the benefit of uh, extensive literature. I know more about the Korean War because of the television show MASH than probably anybody prior to me knew about anything that happened 70 years before their birth or before their adulthood. A different people returns from Babylon. And there are still people who have been there all along, trying to make it work, trying to live under the uh, Babylonian Empire, trying to remember their faith in God. And now the people from Babylon have returned. They are a completely different people than the ones who left, and they are building. They have uh, status within the new Persian Empire. And together, they're trying to re-establish a nation. Malachi says that God is not impressed with their efforts. The difference between Malachi and many of the uh, other prophets in the Book of the Twelve, one of the reasons that Malachi is anonymous is because the role of prophet was a particular social role during the time of the kings. When the Babylonian Empire, when the Neo-Assyrian Empire wiped out the Northern Kingdom and the Babylonian Empire wiped out the Southern Kingdom, the kings ceased to be. The last king of Judah died in Babylon and they would not have another king until the Maccabean revolt in the second century BCE. Without a king, there is no social role for a prophet. Without a person on a throne with authority, with power, there is no role for a person to speak for God face to face with the king. Malachi is doing something different. Malachi is speaking to all the people of the new state of Judah, the new province of Judah in the Persian Empire, who have privilege, who have wealth and with wealth power, and with power, the ability to affect people's lives. Malachi, in fact, must be anonymous because Malachi cannot be public. Because Malachi would have no protection. Let's set that aside for a moment. I'll come back to that. One of the things that empires do 
every empire that has ever existed, is they try to convince you that even if you are from the far-flung territories, from the backwoods, the boondocks of their domain, you too can enjoy imperial power and privilege. The great success of the Roman Empire, which comes just uh, a couple uh, of centuries later than our reading from Malachi, the great success of the Roman Empire was the understanding that anyone who was born a citizen could become the emperor. The emperor did not need to come from the city of Rome or the, uh, the Latin homeland. The emperor could come from anywhere. Anyone born a citizen. creating an aspirational investment in imperial power. If only I can become a citizen by going along with the Roman authorities, then I will have access to wealth and security and my children may have access to the very centers of power. The Roman Empire, more than any other before it, and possibly any other since, excelled in bringing excellence from the fringes into the center. Not only bringing power, not only bringing wealth, not only bringing art and ingenuity, but identifying individual excellence in its uh, subjects and drawing them in as well. The temptation to participate in order to achieve wealth, security, privilege is at the heart of what it means to be imperial. Now imagine... You have lived at the center of empire, you and your parents, for 70 years. The center of empire has shifted away from Babylon. And you have been sent to this backwoods, fringe country. And the authorities there the religious authorities there are telling you that 10% of your income belongs to the temple. Ten percent of your crops, ten percent of your flocks and herds, ten percent of your uh, fruits and and uh, wine belongs to the temple. And you start to do the math. Can I achieve imperial greatness based on 90%? When you've seen the vicissitudes of nature, how easily uh, a crop can fail, how easily a, um, a storm can wipe out everything. When you have seen the uh, capriciousness of some imperial authorities choosing to advance one person over another for arbitrary or unknowable reasons. When you have seen that one percentage point might make the difference, let alone 10 percentage points. You may resent this expectation. How will I care for my household? 
if I must surrender 10%? How will I ensure my children's future security if I must hand over 10%? And so the book of Malachi says, on behalf of God, please, please test me on this. Fill the storehouse of the temple to overflowing and see what happens. Because the temple is where people who cannot eat on their own wherewithal go to beg for a meal. The temple is where people whose household economy has been wiped out for one reason or another go when they have nowhere else to go. It's the place where widows and orphans, or in other, in other words, uh, single mothers and their children, go. It's the place where refugees and immigrants who have not yet gotten up on their feet can go. It's the place where Anyone who is unable to work or unable to get work can go. Malachi is presenting, as did all of the prophets before, an alternative to the imperial understanding of power and security. I've been watching, uh, as movies have been unavailable, new movies, through the pandemic, we've gotten more and more streaming services. I don't know about uh, the rest of you out there or the rest of you here. We had Netflix. We now have Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Crave, and Amazon Prime. And I've been watching a show from my childhood that I enjoyed very much back then, The Golden Girls. Anyone my age or older probably remembers this show very well. Three women in their 50s, plus the 80-year-old uh, mother of one of the three share a house in Miami. remarkable in the fact that it is uh, an entirely, in terms of characters, on-screen characters, entirely uh, female-led and female-driven. It's remarkable for its acting and its uh, writing. And some people, because of the increase of use in use of the streaming services, some people younger than me have taken a great interest in the Golden Girls. And every now and then, I see some comment from folks uh, younger than I am, Generation Z and uh, the younger millennials, saying how impressed they were, they are, that Golden Girls was so ahead of its time. They address acceptance and inclusion of uh, 2S plus and LGBTQ minorities. They address uh, racial justice to a certain degree. They are uh, very sex positive, although they do uh, 
they're sex positive. They aren't necessarily as uh, open to um, uh, Blanche's, at the very least, rumored um, promiscuity. They address uh, abortion and birth control. They grapple with the issues. But what I have to say to those folks who make this observation, those younger millennials and and Generation Z folks who are on the internet making this observation that Golden Girls was ahead of, a to- ahead of its time, what I have to say as someone who was there is, no, it wasn't. It was very much of its time. These were the issues that were being wrestled with at the time, and what you are becoming aware of is how little progress we have made. In some ways, in some, on the matters of some issues, we have been stuck as a Western society. The fact that we are still having the fights and the conversations that the Golden Girls were having in the mid-1980s about abortion, about acceptance and inclusion of uh, 2S plus and LGBTQ minorities, about race and policing, about sex positivity. Shows that something needs to give. And so right now, Today, in churches across the country, and on the first, in uh, towns and cities across the country, we will be having a muted Canada Day observance. Because something's got to give. When... Last Sunday, there was still a preacher in the Roman Catholic Church in Canada defending the good done by the residential school system. Something's got to give. When police in Colorado... A state that, uh, if any state embodies the principle that the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, it ought to be Colorado. A man opened fire on a police officer, killed the police officer, was shot to death by a bystander, who was carrying a firearm, who was then shot to death by police officers who were responding to the initial shooting, proving that the only thing that stops a good guy with a gun is a poorly trained police officer. Something's got to give. We could fool ourselves into thinking that Malachi was ahead of his time. If he is talking about how instead of holding up righteous people, we hold up uh, arrogant people. We uh, encode success in the wrong way. Uh, uh, Looking at people who are uh, famous and wealthy and beautiful as the paragons of success. Success. 
erasing the past ethical behaviors of anyone who achieves the status of billionaire. Because, I don't know, uh, because we assume that uh, you can't unethically become a billionaire? I don't understand. We might be forgiven if we make the mistake of thinking that Malachi can't possibly be talking about what's happening here. Malachi can't possibly be that far ahead of his time. That he would be talking about people hoarding wealth instead of sharing it. That he would be talking about people gathering more and more power to themselves instead of caring for the most vulnerable in their community. Surely this is a 21st century problem. Malachi is not ahead of his time. We have just made tremendous little progress. At every turn, when technology was supposed to make life easier for everyone, it has been turned into uh, a way of making the powerful more powerful and keeping the rest contained. Even now, people like uh, Bezos and uh, Musk are developing technologies that could be used to improve life for everyone. And what do they want to do with them? They want to spread humanity to Mars before we have even solved the problems of Earth. Don't get me wrong, we need to go to Mars. But the way it's being talked about here and now today is about turning advances in technology into money-making opportunities for the wealthy without improving a single other person's life. How do we understand that we have come 22 centuries and are still having the same arguments about whether success and security comes from the concentration of wealth and power or from the distribution of wealth and power? About whether uh, it is good to take care of those who are most in need or whether it is better to let them fend for themselves. Whether it is God's will that the rich become richer or whether it is God's will that those who are on the outside are welcomed in. And I have an answer. It might not be the right answer, it might not even be the best answer, but it's the only answer I have. And it is that the patterns of imperial power have never changed. They have changed on the surface, they have changed in name, they may even have changed uh, in uh, medium, 
whether it is power based on land or power based on cash or power based on prestige, but the patterns of how it plays itself out have never, ever changed. And every one of us has a choice. It's the choice being offered by Malachi. How will I align my values and my choices? Will I align them with the imperial power that says whoever has the power deserves the power? That says you cannot risk what you have because uh, to have nothing is uh, to be nothing? that you cannot risk what you have because there is no one out there to care for you if you need it. That you must take all you can get and hold on to it as tightly as you can. Or will we align our values with folks like Malachi and the other prophets who speak to those in power and say, test God on this. Divert your wealth to the common storehouse and see what happens. Make sure that the neediest among you, the most vulnerable among you, are cared for and see what happens. Forget about getting closer and closer to power and instead get closer and closer to the people around you and see what happens. The fact that Malachi has a message for us has nothing to do with Malachi. Malachi, oh, hello. Don, you've just turned us vertical. Sorry. I don't know if I'm sideways on your screens or, uh, or if I'm, I'm narrow on your screens, but we'll go with it. Malachi's message. For them, oh, other way, Don. Yeah. There we go. Sorry, folks. We've got some new uh, some new devices here in the sanctuary, and uh, we just had to get uh, get a power supply uh, connected to one of them. The message of Malachi for them and for us is forget about oh forget about looking for security from anyone who is only concerned about themselves look for security from one another that's where The Old Testament ends. And it's where our Christian life (laughs) I'm just waiting for it to stop. begins. Amen. Yeah, never get too comfortable with technology because it sometimes has a way of coming back and making your life challenging. 
But that just proves that we're alive, ladies and gentlemen. Deep in our hearts, more Voices 154. The words will be on the screen. of the people this morning are in recognition of Canada Day as well as Canadian Multiculturalism Day. When we pray together in community, the concerns of each of us are shared by all of us, and we're asked to remember uh, in prayer this morning in our uh, regional council um, prayer cycle, the people of Japanese United Church uh, and Southern Alberta Japanese Pastoral Charge in Lethbridge, uh, as well as in the World Council of Churches prayer cycle, the uh, people of Zambia, Kenya, and Tanzania. And closer to home, uh, we give thanks uh, today for our local uh, pastoral relations minister, Reverend Lee Spice, who is retiring. Uh, this is her last week, and she will be replaced uh, by uh, someone known to uh, some of us, at least Reverend Stephen Harper, who has been at uh, Simons Valley United Church uh, these past uh, uh, five, five or six years. So we will... Uh, I invite you to join me in giving thanks for both Lee and Stephen. God of all nations, as we grapple with the future and the past of our country, we take this opportunity in prayer to give you thanks and ask for your wisdom and blessing. Most of us were born here as the children of settlers and immigrants. Some of us descend from the first people to inhabit this land. Some of us have chosen to be here. Some are descended from slaves brought against their will. Some were displaced from their homelands and found their way here in desperation. We are all indigenous, settler, immigrant, refugee, descendant of slaves now trying to understand how to live together in the world that emerges around us. We praise you for all the people who have worked to make this country a place where we can be proud, for we have much to be proud of. Scientific and technological advancements, acts of courage and compassion in times of war and struggle, agriculture that feeds the world outside our borders, prized artists and renowned academics. We pray that we will retain that spirit of excellence, of generosity, and of innovation. At the same time, we are heavy-hearted when we contemplate many choices of our forebears. 
choices about the treatment of black, indigenous, and Asian peoples by the white majority. Choices about the treatment of 2S plus and LGBTQ people by the majority. It can be easy to dismiss stories of abuse, neglect, outright hostility as the unintended consequences of well-meaning decisions or as rare examples of outlying behavior. Give us the strength we will need to properly hear the truth of our past. Give us also the courage to hear the stories that are happening right now in our midst of indigenous women and girls disappearing by the dozens, murdered or trapped, never to be seen again. Of verbal abuse of visible minorities so frequent as to permit no other label than mainstream culture. Of Muslim Canadians and LGBTQ2S plus Canadians being targeted for physical attack of black and indigenous Canadians being subjected to increased scrutiny by bank tellers and others so that a misspelled name on a deposit slip leads to a 12-year-old girl handcuffed in a squad car. We cannot simply praise you for the diversity of our country, for the multiplicity of traditions and religions, the plurality of nationalities and languages, the mosaic of cultures and art forms, we must also commit ourselves to defend that diversity, to enrich it, to make space for it, to heal and encourage the downtrodden victims of white supremacy, patriarchy, and heteronormativity. Without that commitment, our praise is nothing. We cannot simply praise you for the freedom of our country and its democratic principles and prosperous economy. We must also commit to recognizing the important truth that many have not always enjoyed the same freedoms, that our prosperity is built on the land that was taken through dishonest means and on the backs of non-white, non-European and non-Anglophone immigrants who have often been excluded from the full fruits of their labors. Without that commitment, our praise is nothing. You call us to choose life over death, blessing over curse, healing over suffering, peacemaking over violence, generosity over greed, hope in place of terror, love in place of despair, and courage in place of grief. Help us to love our country and truly heal its wounds. Help us to speak words of vision and perseverance in times of uncertainty. Help us to nurture future generations in such a way that they will learn from past misdeeds. And we name before you now in a time of silent prayer all who are in our hearts. We pray in silence. All our relations. Amen. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I keep looking at the time and having to remind myself that we started at about eight minutes past ten, so it's not uh, uh, as, uh, we're not as far into the service as the clock might make me think we are. On the screen now and also available on the website are all of the ways that we can contribute to the ongoing ministries of Wild Rose United Church. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of the congregation and the board uh, for all of the gifts that you have continued to provide through the uh, pandemic. Um, all of our offerings further the renewing and reconciling work of God and the church. And as we contemplate our offering, Dan and Claude have some music to share.
sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will hear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you people's pain I have wept for love of them they turn away I will break their hearts of stone give them hearts for love alone I will speak my word to them whom shall I send here I am Holy One, we dedicate all that we have and all that we are to serve your divine purposes. We thank you for the wonders of life and pray that through our gifts, all our relations will be strengthened and healed. Amen. In the words of the sending forth, uh, I invite you to join in the portions printed in yellow. Beloveds, press on to know the Holy One who restores us to life and returns us home. We are called to transform conflict into cooperation to make swords into plowshares. Let us put faithful discipleship first in our hearts, so blessings will abound for all our relations. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in your life of faith, so that by the virtue of the Holy Spirit you may overflow with hope. And may the God of peace be with you all, today and always. Amen.